We are uh, back in uh, Senior English B, and our objective now for a few moments is to spend time with one of the greatest authors of the 20th century, James Joyce. I'm with you on page 1235 of your hymnal. There are your dates. You can write them down. Notice we're going to have him beginning in 1880s, dying by 1941. But the date, that most important date for us, is 1922. We want to write that date down. No doubt about it. That's the most important literary year of the 20th century. Two important texts get published in 1922 that will kind of stand as the most important two texts of the century. The first, T.S. Eliot's poem, Wasteland. You all maybe remember you had an opportunity to at least just listen to that. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory with desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. You'll remember that we said that T.S. Eliot's Wasteland is easily or better easily understood by studying his classic poem, Hollow Men. We are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men. In the same year, 1922, another writer, James Joyce, will publish the most important novel of the 20th century. The title of that novel is Ulysses. Ulysses. At the very end of the 19th century, uh, at the very end of the 20th century, just a few years after you were born, when we were moving to the new century, Random House, a very famous publisher, decided to do a little project where they would list the 100 greatest novels written in the 20th century. And then they published this list. They published it in an order, number one, two, three, four, five. Got me? Huge debate about this list. What authors would make it? If authors made it at all, what books, novels, would they be represented with? How many of those novels? So, for example, if you're going to publish a list of the 100 greatest novelists of the 20th century, you probably got to put a cat like Hemingway on that list. But the question was, how many of his novels, and in what order will you put those novels? You see what I'm saying? But, of course, the biggest debate would happen with the top five. What would be considered the five most important novels of the 20th century? By the way, just for kicks and giggles later, you want to work on Google. You can find this list of your own accord. It's a fascinating list. And you could do worse than to say, before I die, I'd like to read the list of novels on this list. That'd be a, that'd be a good little reading project for you. But you probably would be interested to know what are the top five. Number one, James Joyce's Ulysses. Number five, James Joyce's Portrait of the artist as a young man. Are you ready for this? This cat gets two of his novels in the top five of the entire 20th century. He gets two of his novels in the top five. Everybody else kills to get one novel listed somewhere near the bottom. This guy gets two in the top five, which right away tells us we're dealing with a major gun. All right, what makes him so important? Well... He's controversial. But what makes him controversial has a lot to do with Sigmund Freud. Now, who is Sigmund Freud? Well, Freud is a famous Viennese psychiatrist who is going to be very influential in the early part of the 20th century for an idea that Freud will invent, in many ways invent, certainly make popular if not invent, about a way to look at human consciousness the way we think. Freud said it this way. If we were to crawl right now into Mr. Beck's brain, and we were to look at his thoughts, and we were to see his thoughts written the way the bottom of ESPN runs that information, that ticker tape information, you may be seeing it on ESPN, so you've got what's going on on the screen, and then along the bottom you've got words. If we were to create that ticker tape of the stuff that Beck's thinking right now as I'm speaking, and you were able to stand inside of his brain and look at like a TV camera and go, oh, or, or a monitor and go, oh, you're thinking these things. Freud said two really important things about the stuff that we would see. One, he said you wouldn't see a single line like ESPN has along the bottom. You would see multiple lines of stuff going across the screen. Different thoughts he's having right now, different thoughts about different things all at the same time. He's actually thinking these thoughts right now. Number two, about those thoughts, he would say, if you were to call him out on it, oh, I see you're thinking about blah, 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 blah. He would say, most of this time, he would say, no, I'm not. I am not thinking that. 
And guess what? He is unaware that he is thinking that stuff. Which is why Freud was so interested in dream interpretation. Because he said when you dream, all of those different strands of thinking start to come to the surface and you become aware of them. So he wrote a very famous book called Interpretation of Dreams where he said, if you want to know what you're thinking about, what your concerns are, you have to look at dreams. But he said some very, con Freud said some very controversial things about some of those lines. He said one of those lines... Definitely sex. Definitely sex. Human beings, male and female, constantly thinking about sex. Are you ready for this? It has less to do with hanky-panky than you would think. It has to do with what Darwin had to say about survival of the species. Right? Freud agreed with Darwin to this degree. The human species is constantly concerned with its own survival. Therefore, sex. That is to say breeding, having, having more progeny. So constantly thinking about sex. The other one that's interesting is anxiety, fear, worry, wally hands, concern, concern, concern. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? At the root of that anxiety for Freud is the fear of death. See, that's the one thing we all know is going to happen, right? And the only difference between Beck and a fly, maybe there's others, but the big difference between Beck and a fly is that Beck knows about fly swatters. A fly does not. A fly just flies around, right? But Beck knows the fly swatter is coming. Capital D, death. He knows it's coming, it's just a matter of when, right? Because he knows that, Beck lives constantly thinking, is today the last day? Today may be the last day. I don't know, I don't know. Worry, worry, worry. This word is anxiety. Finally, there's a third thing. And these all kind of start to go together if you think about it. Sex, anxiety. What's the third one? Aggression. Beck would like to just pick up a bat and bash somebody, we won't say who, over the head. He'd like to do that. The only reason that he doesn't do that is because he lives in a culture where he's told you shouldn't do that. If he was allowed to act out on his own, he would definitely do that. And in fact, Freud went so far to begin to suggest, this is why sport starts to matter so much. We can go out and we can bash each other over the head. We're talking, obviously, a masculine world, right? We can bash each other over the head through the form of sports. What did the Greeks invent? Well, they invented poetry, you're going to say, and you'd be right. But what else did they invent? They invented, of course, the Olympics. And what's central to the Olympics? What two events? you got to have your test of speed and your test of strength, which is, of course, the oldest form of sport. We all know it's wrestling, don't we, right? If it's not wrestling, it's swimming. Swimming and competitive swimming is probably those two. Of course, that makes sense because the Athenians lived right next to the ocean, so it was easy to have swimming contests as well. When you study, for example, the Odyssey, you can see both of those are evidenced, right? Swimming and, and wrestling, the two sports of all time. This idea of aggression is also central, okay? All of this comes to James Joyce. He, along with Virginia Woolf, along with other writers of his time, begin to ask a simple question. What if we represented the human thinking in the form of art? I'll say it again because it's so important to Picasso as well. What if we start to represent human thinking in the form of art? How would you do that? Well, if it's true that Mr. Beck, for example, has these multiple thoughts going on in his head, and you wanted to reference that what's inside of his head, you would not be writing so much about what he's doing physically, he's just sitting in class, versus what he's thinking about. He could be all over the place there. So Joyce does something very experimental in his novel, Ulysses. Now we're ready to talk about Joyce. He does the following. He asks a simple question. What if I did nothing but report what a guy thinks for a single day? And all I did was write the words that he's thinking. See, because have you noticed this? When you think thoughts, you don't use punctuation. There are no question marks in your mind when you think a thought to yourself. Shall, shall I go out? You don't do this. Shall I go to prompt? Question mark. You do it when you text, but you don't do it when you think. There are no punctuation marks when you think. There are no commas in your mind. What would happen if you just wanted to reproduce what was going on in your mind? Are you ready for this? James Joyce in Ulysses writes 900 pages and tells the thoughts of one man for one day. One day. But here's what Freud said. If we hit the print key on the imaginary printer that would give us all of that stuff, all those different lines that Beck is thinking, that you are thinking right now, it would fill up this room 
in one day. Easy. Because you think millions and millions of thoughts. Freud said you're thinking them right now on multiple levels. You're thinking about stuff 80 to 90% of it. You don't even know you're thinking. It's buried deep beneath in the unconscious, later called the subconscious. Freud never used the term. Unconscious. Now, much of Freud now, of course, today has been debunked, and there's lots of debate about him and the like. But when we look at, our, uh, when we look at James Joyce, we have to appreciate very, very experimental. By the way, the novel Ulysses published in 1922, are you ready for this? Banned in America, censored. Banned in America because it's so obscene. So, for example, you're going to have Leopold walk into the uh, butcher's store. And all he's doing is standing in line. But in walks a young lady who looks rather nice. And all he does is look at her while she orders and gets her stuff. But he's thinking the whole time. And Joyce will tell us what he's thinking about. Uh-oh! And immediately the censors come out. You got me. So you got all kinds of, would you be shocked to hear this? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That is to say the stuff I just listed Freud said we're always thinking about. Violence and sex and anxieties, worry, worry, worry. All of that's going to end up in that novel. Okay? It becomes the novel of the 20th century because it is so experimental. But he also published, Joyce, also published a collection of short stories of which one is called Araby. Now let's take a look at this text, Araby. Araby is our word today, thrift store or little get together for a shopping district. We might call it a mall. Do you got me? Okay, that's what we would think of today. In our story, we're going to have a young boy who is going to want to go to the bazaar, to the Araby, because he wants to buy his girl something. <coughs> Two things of importance for your notes. One, he almost doesn't make it there at all. Why? Because adults get in his way. Two, he does finally get there, and when he gets there, uh, he doesn't have enough money to buy what he wants. And so, the final lines of the story will be the ones that usually, if you have to write about the story, and you will, that you usually have to write about. Let's just follow it. James Joyce is Araby. Araby. James Joyce. In... Araby, a short story by James Joyce. A boy becomes infatuated with a girl who lives in his neighborhood. Read along to find out what he learns about himself through this experience. Now I'm going to tell you, Joyce is Irish. And so we've got a professional reader reading Joyce's language in an Irish dialect, which will make it that much funner to read. But you've got to sit up, use your pen, uh, 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 tip, and follow the words. You'll do much better, and of course you'll do much better on the exam as well. Here we go. North Richmond Street, being blind, was a quiet street except at the hour when the Christian Brothers School set the boys free. An uninhabited house of two stories stood at the blind end, detached from its neighbors in a square ground. The other houses of the street, conscious of decent lives within them, gazed at one another with brown, imperturbable faces. The former tenant of our house, a priest, had died in the back drawing room. Air, musty from having been long enclosed, hung in all the rooms, and the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old, useless papers. Among these, I found a few paper-covered books, the pages of which were curled and damp. The Abbot, by Walter Scott, the devout communicant, and the memoirs of a duck. I liked the last best because its leaves were yellow. The wild garden behind the house contained a central apple tree and a few straggling bushes under one of which I found the late tenant's rusty bicycle pump. He had been a very charitable priest. In his will he had left all his money to institutions and the furniture of his house to his sister. When the short days of winter came, dusk fell before we had well eaten our dinners. When we met in the streets, the houses had grown somber. The space of sky above us was the colour of ever-changing violet, and towards it the lamps of the street lifted their feeble lanterns. The cold air stung us, and we played till our bodies glowed. Our shouts echoed in the silent street. The career of our play brought us through the dark, muddy lanes behind the houses where we ran the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages, to the back doors of the dark, dripping gardens where odours arose from the ash pits to the dark, odorous stables where a coachman smoothed 
and combed the horse or shook music from the buckled harness. When we returned to the street, light from the kitchen windows had filled the areas. If my uncle was seen turning the corner, we hid in the shadow until we had seen him safely housed. Or if Mangan's sister came out on the doorstep to call her brother into his tea, we watched her from our shadow peer up and down the street. We waited to see whether she would remain or go in. And if she remained, we left our shadow and walked up to Mangan's steps resignedly. She was waiting for us, her figure defined by the light from the half-open door. Her brother always teased her before he obeyed, and I stood by the railings looking at her. Her dress swung as she moved her body, and the soft rope of her hair tossed from side to side. Every morning I lay on the floor in the front parlour watching her door. The blind was pulled down to within an inch of the sash so that I could not be seen. When she came out on the doorstep, my heart leaped. I ran to the hall, seized my books and followed her. I kept her brown figure always in my eye. And when she came near the point at which our ways diverged, I quickened my pace and passed her. This happened morning after morning. I had never spoken to her except for a few casual words, and yet her name was like a summons to all my foolish blood. Her image accompanied me even in places the most hostile to romance. On Saturday evenings, when my aunt went marketing, I had to go to carry some of the parcels. We walked through the flaring streets, jostled by drunken men and bargaining women, amid the curses of labourers, the shrill litanies of shop boys who stood on guard by the barrels of pig's cheeks, the nasal chanting of street singers who sang a Come All You about O'Donovan Rossa or a ballad about the troubles in our native land. These noises converged in a single sensation of life for me. I imagined that I bore my chalice safely through a throng of foes. Her name sprang to my lips at moments in strange prayers and praises which I myself did not understand. My eyes were often full of tears, I could not tell why. And at times a flood from my heart seemed to pour itself out into my bosom. I thought little of the future. I did not know whether I would ever speak to her or not, or, if I spoke to her, how I could tell her of my confused adoration. But my body was like a harp, and her words and gestures were like fingers running upon the wires. One evening I went into the back drawing room in which the priest had died. It was a dark, rainy evening, and there was no sound in the house. Through one of the broken panes I heard the rain impinge upon the earth, the fine, incessant needles of water playing in the sodden beds. Some distant lamp or lighted window gleamed below me. I was thankful that I could see so little. All my senses seemed to desire to veil themselves, and feeling that I was about to slip from them, I pressed the palms of my hands together until they trembled, murmuring, Oh, love, oh, love, many times. At last she spoke to me. When she addressed the first words to me, I was so confused that I did not know what to answer. She asked me, was I going to Araby? I forgot whether I answered yes or no. It would be a splendid bazaar, she said. She would love to go. And why can't you? I asked. While she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet round and round her wrist. She could not go, she said, because there would be a retreat that week in her convent. Her brother and two other boys were fighting for their caps and I was alone at the railings. She held one of the spikes, bowing her head towards me. The light from the lamp opposite our door caught the white curve of her neck, lit up her hair that rested there, and falling, lit up the hand upon the railing. It fell over one side of her dress and caught the white border of a petticoat, just visible as she stood at ease. It's well for you, she said. If I go, I said, I will bring you something. What innumerable follies laid waste my waking and sleeping thoughts after that evening. I wished to annihilate the tedious intervening days. I chafed against the work of school. At night, in my bedroom and by day in the classroom, her image came between me and the page I strove to read. The syllables of the word Araby were called to me through the silence in which my soul exuriated and cast an eastern enchantment over me. 
I asked for leave to go to the bazaar on Saturday night. My aunt was surprised and hoped it was not some Freemason affair. I answered few questions in class. I watched my master's face pass from amiability to sternness. He hoped I was not beginning to idle. I could not call my wandering thoughts together. I had hardly any patience with the serious work of life which, now that it had stood between me and my desire, seemed to me child's play, ugly, monotonous child's play. On Saturday morning, I reminded my uncle that I wished to go to the bazaar in the evening. He was fussing at the hall stand, looking for the hat brush, and answered me curtly, Yes, boy, I know. As he was in the hall, I could not go into the front parlour and lie at the window. I left the house in bad humour and walked slowly towards the school. The air was pitilessly raw, and already my heart misgave me. When I came home to dinner, my uncle had not yet been home. Still, it was early. I sat staring at the clock for some time, and when its ticking began to irritate me, I left the room. I mounted the staircase and gained the upper part of the house. The high, cold, empty, gloomy rooms liberated me, and I went from room to room, singing. From the front window I saw my companions playing below in the street. Their cries reached me weakened and indistinct, and, leaning my forehead against the cool glass, I looked over at the dark house where she lived. I may have stood there for an hour, seeing nothing but the brown-clad figure cast by my imagination, touched discreetly by the lamplight at the curved neck, at the hand upon the railings, and at the border below the dress. When I came downstairs again, I found Mrs. Mercer sitting at the fire. She was an old garrulous woman, a pawnbroker's widow who collected used stamps for some pious purpose. I had to endure the gossip of the tea table. The meal was prolonged beyond an hour, and still my uncle did not come. Mrs. Mercer stood up to go. She was sorry she couldn't wait any longer, but it was after eight o'clock and she did not like to be out late, as the night air was bad for her. When she had gone, I began to walk up and down the room, clenching my fists. My aunt said, I'm afraid you may put off your bazaar for this night of our Lord. At nine o'clock, I heard my uncle's latchkey in the hall door. I heard him talking to himself and heard the hall stand rocking when it had received the weight of his overcoat. I could interpret these signs. When he was midway through his dinner, I asked him to give me the money to go to the bazaar. He had forgotten. The people are in bed and after their first sleep now, he said. I did not smile. My aunt said to him energetically, Can't you give him the money and let him go? You've kept him late enough as it is. My uncle said he was very sorry he had forgotten. He said he believed in the old saying, All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. He asked me where I was going and when I had told him a second time, he asked me, Did I know the Arab's farewell to his steed? When I left the kitchen, he was about to recite the opening lines of the piece to my aunt. I held a florin tightly in my hand as I strode down Buckingham Street towards the station. The sight of the streets, thronged with boyers and glaring with gas, recalled to me the purpose of my journey. I took my seat in the third-class carriage of a deserted train. After an intolerable delay, the train moved out of the station slowly. It crept onward among ruinous houses and over the twinkling river. At Westland Row Station, a crowd of people pressed to the carriage doors, but the porters moved them back, saying that it was a special train for the bazaar. I remained alone in the bare carriage. In a few minutes, the train drew up beside an improvised wooden platform. I passed out onto the road and saw by the lighted dial of a clock that it was ten minutes to ten. In front of me was a large building which displayed the magical name. I could not find any sixpenny entrance, and, <coughs> fearing that the bazaar would be closed, I passed in quickly through a turnstile, handing a shilling to a weary-looking man. I found myself in a big hall girdled at half its height by a gallery. Nearly all the stalls were closed, and the greater part of the hall was in darkness. I recognised a silence like that which pervades a church after a service. I walked into the centre of the bazaar timidly. A few people were gathered about the stalls which were still open. Before a curtain, over which the words Café Chantant were written in coloured lamps, two men were counting money on a salver. 
I listened to the fall of the coins. Remembering with difficulty why I had come, I went over to one of the stalls and examined porcelain vases and flowered tea sets. At the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen. I remarked their English accents and listened vaguely to their conversation. Oh, I never said such a thing. Oh, but you did. Oh, but I didn't. Didn't she say that? Yes, I heard her. Oh, there's a fib. Observing me, the young lady came over and asked me did I wish to buy anything. The tone of her voice was not encouraging. She seemed to have spoken to me out of a sense of duty. I looked humbly at the great jars that stood like eastern guards at either side of the dark entrance to the stall and murmured, No, thank you. The young lady changed the position of one of the vases and went back to the two young men. They began to talk of the same subject. Once or twice the young lady glanced at me over her shoulder. I lingered before her stall. Study these lines. Stay was useless to make my interest in her wares seem the more real. And then I turned away slowly and walked down the middle of the bazaar. I allowed the two pennies to fall against the sixpence in my pocket. I heard a voice call from one end of the gallery that the light was out. The upper part of the hall was now completely dark. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity. And my eyes burned with anguish and anger. Let's say uh, really quickly one thing about the end of this story. Notice, James Joyce is going to love this phrase, epiphany, or that which is a sudden uh, uh, kind of awareness. Notice the last line. Gazing up into the darkness, I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity. Everything is useless. My eyes burned with anguish and anger. The young man learned something about himself at the end of the story, good or bad. Yeah, not so good, huh? Kind of depressing. Thank you.